One of the more prominent types of posts I get in the comments section here and at Event Horizon revolve around the controversy regarding the interstellar object 3i Atlas and whether it is or is not a comet. This is actually a more in-depth question than you might realize in that while I am personally convinced it's analogous to a comet, albeit one with unusual attributes, regardless of what you think 3i Atlas is, it's actually not quite correct to call it a comet. It is, in fact, an exocomet. Or is it? In fact, the proper way to say it may be that it used to be an exocomet. More on that in a bit. This is a term that was sort of lost in the fray of the controversy, but it reminded me of a paper from a few years ago that's relevant. The 2017 paper is by S. Rappaport and colleagues and details how they searched the light curve data from the Kepler spacecraft looking for signatures of exocomets in that data and found strong evidence for their presence in some other star systems, and how they actually show a very specific hook-like profile in light curves of that type. This was interesting at the time because in those days, Tabby Star was making regular headlines as each new paper came out and the main hypothesis to explain that star, which that star is still partly a mystery to this day, was a hail of cold comets entering that star system from its Oort cloud and all colliding and spreading cold dust in the system, resulting in the bizarre light curves that were being seen at the time. It turns out the Rapport paper actually called that explanation into question because the Tabby star light curves were not showing the hooked tail signature of exocomets. To this day, the evidence for periodicity, which would mean that whatever is obscuring the star is in orbit of it, remains weak potentially pointing towards some kind of interstellar dust cloud passing by in the foreground, but not affecting any nearby stars, suggesting that it's either very small or fairly local to the star itself, but not in orbit of it. The question of the nature of 3i Atlas, of course, comes with the claim that it might be an alien spacecraft. This is based on one interpretation that the size of the object appears very large, and the larger something is in the universe, the rarer it tends to be which means we should not randomly see such a large interstellar object passing through this early in the game, where we've only recently become capable of detecting such a thing. Indeed, it should on average take thousands of years of observing before you spot one that large. But the interpretation is not the only one. The Hubble Space Telescope's data seems to suggest a much smaller size for the nucleus embedded inside a large reflective coma, giving it the illusion of being large when it's not. Everything else about that object, and its somewhat anomalous features, was largely a thought experiment. The original Hibbard and colleagues paper makes that clear, with the conclusion that it's probably a comet. But the point was, what you might look for and interpret when looking for artificial technology using this object as a reference. Oddly, that paper is often attributed incorrectly directly to Avi Loeb, when in fact, Loeb was the third author on it. Of course, the media sensationalized it, but that's what they do. Loeb's point basically is that we have absolutely no idea what aliens do, what they intend if they can get here, or how to even recognize it if they do. So you really should try to figure out what to look for if you are to do close SETI. Well, one thing to look for is anomalous behavior, which the comet does have. But I do not think it's enough to go into alien territory. The reason is that I do not think a rationally behaving alien spacecraft would outgas the materials that it is, and wasting them. And they are the same chemistry of a normal solar system comet, just at levels very different from our comets. This looks like unthinking, wasteful outgassing, rather than technology. Nature does not care about efficiency, whereas technology tends to focus on efficiency as best it can. Why waste when you have a brain behind it that understands the value of not wasting? Some have said aliens might try to mask themselves by acting like a comet, but they did not do a good job here since we noticed its anomalous behavior. There's also a much easier way to do that and hide. Grab a natural comet, latch onto it with your craft, and no one would ever be the wiser that you are hiding on it, because it would look stereotypically like a comet and show no anomalies. Find a boring one, and there you go, stealth achieved. Also, it's completely fair to expect that since 3i is from a completely different and much older star system than our own, with a completely unknown history of what it encountered along the way, that it might look a bit different from a solar system comet. 
Incidentally, and this isn't often mentioned, there are indeed ways cometary material could behave that's much further outside of what we're seeing with 3i. There are ways this object could have been far stranger. Examples of that would be a signature of certain radioactive isotopes. Outgassing materials not typical for a comet with no known way for them to be there, and so on. It can get much weirder than this. Indeed, Tabby Star was actually significantly more interesting from the alien point of view than 3i, because things developed in such a way that, for a time, its stock was rising on that count more than anything else I've seen in years of doing this other than the recent detection of difficult to explain without past life chemistry on Mars. It even got to the point that a paper was released that surveyed a large number of targets with optical SETI searches, and the study yielded one single candidate out of several thousand targets, and it was Tabby Star. The researchers, however, noted that they believed the detection had been an errant cosmic ray entering the telescope, not an optical signal detection. But one wonders if they had other detections that were not Tabby Star and if they would have come to the same conclusion about those and negated the whole point of their survey. But back to the nature of 3i Atlas and what to call it. I think the best term I can come up with is a rogue comet in the same grain as a rogue planet flying interstellar space after getting ejected from its star system of origin. Interestingly, it actually is marginally possible though very unlikely due to the much lower mass budget of large objects in the galaxy compared to small things like comets, for a rogue planet to come cooking through and potentially disrupting a star system. It's a non-zero chance and probably has happened somewhere in the universe before, but not common at all. But ultimately, this is just playing around with human terms and labels. 3 Atlas doesn't care what we call it. But now to the elephant in the room. My last update did not include the infamous anti-tail of 3i Atlas. I left it off because preferential outgassing towards the heat source is a pretty straightforward concept. I suspect that's what it is, especially with its odd profile and uncertain history. But I've also seen mistakes made even by professional astronomers regarding cometary anti-tails. Lots of comets have them, but they really aren't anti-tails. They are a perspective effect. You are seeing material that came off the comet in the path that the comet just came from. It's not something that the comet itself is doing. It's how you are viewing it. That's not what's going on with 3i Atlas's anti-tail, which is not a matter of perspective. The comet actually is doing it on its own. And it's at least a very rare thing for a comet to do, but it may not be rare at all for a rogue comet that's been in the interstellar medium as long as Atlas has. So I'd want to see a large sampling of rogue comets to see how rare that phenomenon is. I'm also interested in seeing if the anti-tail disappears. As it stands, now that Atlas is leaving our sight and heading behind the sun, in just a few days, begin the observations from Mars and the rest of the solar system. So far at Mars, two missions from the European Space Agency will attempt observations, along with NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And then the JUICE spacecraft on its way to Jupiter will also make observations. But don't expect spectacular images of 3i Atlas from these spacecraft, as they simply were not built for this kind of work. It's merely that they have instruments that can be used to take data on the object. But the data they will get will be useful, especially in regards to MRO, because it should be able to constrain the size of the nucleus and end the size debate, whether it ends up large or small. It'll be interesting if it ends up large. One major question remaining with Atlas is, where is all the iron? The object shows nickel outgassing, but very little iron. I think this may be resolved soon in that it's possible that the iron is there, and we simply were not able to see it in the initial observations. It would not surprise me in the least if we see a new measurement and detect the iron, because iron and nickel are formed in the same way in supernovae together. This is why when we look at metals and meteorites, we always see iron and nickel together, but with a much larger proportion of iron than nickel, so you'd expect that from Atlas as well. But there may be a detection problem in this one, and that may change the situation with iron dramatically. But the line between cometary material and asteroid material is blurred. They share many things, including iron. A worn-out comet devoid of its original volatile icy materials basically becomes a carbonaceous asteroid. 
and asteroids with deep volatiles left can, if briefly, outgas like comets. The question of iron and nickel also blurs both classifications, but objects like asteroids and comets are intriguing because they tend to contain the precursor chemicals for life. Comets often contain many carbon compounds and even amino acids. But even in higher iron environments like asteroids, there are mysteries regarding life. For fun, this is an etched slice of an iron meteorite, originally from the core of a destroyed planetesimal or large asteroid. I recently acquired it, and it was found some years ago somewhere in northeast Africa. You can see the iron and nickel chemistry in the alloys of those metals differentiate in a slow cooling environment to form crystals in the parent body after it formed, called Widmanstaten lines, that are revealed when you etch the sawn face of a meteorite slice with acid, as you can see here. This particular specimen features an anomaly, a series of what appear to be inclusions situated in a line. That's a very unusual feature for an iron meteorite, and it's hard to see what might have caused it. But iron meteorites tend to be poorly studied, so I'm not sure if this phenomenon is present in other irons, and just hasn't been noted, or whatever. All I know is that it's visible on both sides of the 3mm thick slice. Anyway, for fun. But the nature of those inclusions and the others in the specimen is even more intriguing. The inclusions seen in iron meteorites involve several different minerals. Many of the component alloys and minerals in irons either do not occur on Earth or are very rare natively. One such mineral is schreibersite, present in the inclusions in this meteorite, and in fact, the moon. This one has a few known surface geologic sources here on Earth. It's super rare on Earth otherwise, but is common in metallic meteorites. It is an iron nickel phosphide, phosphorus, which is necessary for life. Indeed, it is a fertilizer, and the rare phosphorus problem is one of the proposed solutions to the Fermi paradox. This may strengthen or weaken that solution, but here's the mystery, now somewhat obscure. In 2007, it was suggested that Schreibersite and other phosphorus-bearing minerals and meteorites may have been the source for Earth's surface phosphorus that all life absolutely depends on, to the point that we mine so much phosphorus for agriculture that we will eventually run out of ready deposits of it. Earth does not have infinite surface-accessible phosphorus. Asteroids, however, have plenty of it, a boon for anyone growing food in space and it's likely to be something we take advantage of if we get to the asteroid mining stage. This might be something important that comes from the Psyche mission on its way to explore a metal-rich asteroid as I speak. Look for phosphorus. But in 2013, researchers were able to produce pyrophosphite in a lab from Schreibersite. Basically, they put it in warm, acidic water, like you would find in a warm volcanic environment which was much more common on primordial Earth than they are today, though they do still exist, of course. And lightning is a wild card here, as far as energy sources for chemistry on Earth. But the production of pyrophosphate was almost chilling, and here's why. We may have seen part of the prebiotic chemical evolution of life on Earth in this experiment, in an area that independently has, in other ways, moved to the top of the list for where a biogenesis happened volcanic hot springs. This is a possible chemical precursor in nature to pyrophosphate, and that is in turn associated with ATP. This is adenosine triphosphate, and it is the energy source of metabolism in all life on Earth. This chemical works like money. It allows energy transfer, transactions if you will, between cells. This is how muscles and nerves work in the human body, and it very well may have come from chemicals delivered by meteorites like my sample during the late heavy bombardment. An iron meteorite rich in Schreibersite rusting away in a hot spring might well have done some interesting things. But back to 3i Atlas. Interstellar objects like 3i are important to study for countless reasons. This is brand new scientific territory, everyone, and we get to watch it unfold. But if we get to determine whether these objects have phosphorus, perhaps easier said than done, but sample return would be wonderful here, we may have a very interesting probe to a further mystery of life on Earth, and indeed, testing a Fermi Paradox solution. There are indicators that phosphorus is rather spotty in the Milky Way, but the data on that is not robust yet. But by measuring phosphorus in nebulae, 
The result was some star forming regions seem to be poor in it. And that means that any systems they form are likely to start out with little phosphorus, which if our planet is an indicator, is a shutdown for life in those star systems that form in that environment. Well, that means that their ejected rogue comets should not have much in the way of phosphorus. Well, if we have a sample of measurements of phosphorus from objects like 3i Atlas, 2i Borisov, etc., then the galaxy just handed us a growing random sampling to look at and see if phosphorus is indeed spotty in the Milky Way, and we got lucky on that count, or we would not be here, or it is in fact everywhere. Only time will tell and figuring out how to measure phosphorus in these objects. But anyway, mysteries upon mysteries are hidden here with interstellar objects much more than superficial stuff floating around right now. And I will continue making updates as new information comes in on 3i Atlas, which we should know something more from the probes by mid-October. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently reminding the long-term listeners and new ones, welcome, that October and the Halloween season is upon us. So for this last video of September, I declare spooky season is now open. I've accumulated some good spooky but real science ones this year. So get out the pumpkins and the hot fall beverages of choice and get comfortable, relax, and sleep crowd. Put on the comfy bunny slippers and get ready for bed and let's do this. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we dream.